Hey guys, it's Bill from Linden, Tennessee. This is going to be a video for the uninitiated. If you're just finding this channel, this is my Cub Cadet 4x4 articulated electric tractor. Over the last year or so, I've been building this. I've got about 53 other videos on my YouTube channel here, but if you haven't seen them, uh, I assure you they're all really, really entertaining. <laughs> uh, or not. But if you haven't seen them, this is going to be just kind of a, a walk around of what in the world this thing is. And sort of some of the components that are in it and what it does. This part of the video I call the walk around. Now, give me a second. I'm going to pop the hood. All right. So under here, I guess, I guess the best way to start is what are we looking at? So this started life as two Cub Cadet tractors from the 60s or 70s. One of them was a hydrostatic 1-2-3 model. I'm not really sure what the other one was. The hydrostatic model is what's called a narrow frame. And the other one, whatever it was, it's called a wide frame. And... They get their names because they start out narrow, but then they get wide. So that's what this is. This one is the most complete of the two frames. In life, about right here on back, I have cut off and flipped around 180. I also cut off about three inches out of the middle. So this part plus three inches was originally up here. And that so obviously what that did is it took my transmission and brought it up to the front. It used to be in the back, now it's in the front. Back here we've got my narrow frame. Narrow frames, in addition to being narrower at the front, are also shorter. And I had to add some here. In hindsight, I should have just got another wide frame. Then I wouldn't have had to add that. But, you know, I did it. And uh, I haven't really done any modifications with it other than cutting the front off. <laughs> well, I say I haven't done any modifications. I've modified it a lot. But the basic frame, I cut the front off. Then, moving up here, we've got Nissan Leaf battery pack. This is out of a salvaged car. In life, these would have been, each of these modules, there would have been 48 of them in the car. I've got 14, and I've got them in two groups of seven. So each of these seven are in series, and those two groups of seven are in parallel. That gives me a, a voltage of, air quotes, 48 volts. The charge voltage is 57 but it's still considered a 48 volt battery. This here is the charger. You just plug it into a 110 volt extension cord. Underneath of the charger, this is what's called a DC to DC converter. What it does is it takes the 48 volts from the battery pack and steps it down to 12 volts to keep my little lawn and garden 12 volt battery charged. Now on an EV like this, you don't really need a battery. The only reason I have one is because I also have a winch. Why do I have a winch? It's because I'm a guy. Guys have winches. There's other more reasons to it too, but we'll get to that when we get to that. From the battery, the power flows to what's called an inverter. This inverter takes the direct current from the battery, changes it to three-phase AC, three-phase alternating current, and sends that to an induction motor. Now, an induction motor is what uh, Nikola Tesla himself came up with back 100, over 100 years ago. And the design of it hasn't changed. It's very simple in design, very low in part count and reliable. What you have is you've got a, an iron core in the center mounted on a couple bearings so it spins. And on the outside you've got some windings. The inverter, through these three phases, sends electricity through those windings. When you do that you end up with a magnetic field. The inverter says, kind of like a firing order in a car, it'll go one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. Those windings are arranged one, two, three, one, two, three. So what happens is you end up with a, a rotating electric field, a rotating magnetic field. That's how you go. Whenever you rotate this electric field, uh, it, it induces a magnet in the rotor. That's why they call it an induction motor. It induces a magnetic field in the rotor, and then that magnetic field chases that rotating magnetic field around. That is about as simple a description of that as I can give you. If you want to know more, there's plenty out there. 
uh, is actually really fascinating how it worked and how he could just kind of come up with that because like it didn't exist and he just thought of it and it works and that's fabulous. A cool thing about induction motors is, so it goes one, two, three, one, two, three. If you switch two of these leads, the motor now sees one, three, two, one, three, two. Instead of one, two, three, it goes one, three, two, one, three, two, one, three, two. And that makes it go backwards. It does that when you flip a switch. So that's how you get reversed. So I don't have a gearbox or a clutch or anything. The other feature of that is when you let off the accelerator, it does the same thing. So it sends reverse torque to the motor. That's how you get re uh, regenerative braking. That's what regenerative braking is, sending reverse torque to the motor. And the motor then becomes a generator because it's being turned by the motion of the tractor and it sends some energy back into the battery. So instead of wasting that energy at turning it into heat through the brakes, it converts it back into electricity and sends it back into the battery. So nothing in life is efficient, 100% efficient, but this is pretty damn close. These are typically 80 to 90% efficient. We're going to call this 90% efficient because it's mine and I want to brag on it. With that in mind, all any, any power that goes into here... 90% of it goes into the motor to make the thing go. The other 10% is converted into heat. And that heat needs to be dissipated because there's sensitive electronics in here and you want to keep them, uh, you want to keep their temperature regulated. You don't want to get them too hot. So up in front, we've got a cooling system. We've got a little 12 volt electric pump here. We've got some little, a little catch can that I I've fabbed up in the shop here that holds the coolant. And then we've got a little transmission cooler that you know, it'd be for like your small, your, your truck, your pickup truck for, for keeping your transmission cool. Then behind that is a little bitty fan that you'd see on the back of your, com um, a computer that would like be on the floor, like the big computers back, you know, back 10 years ago, back before computers were small. And this one was off of eBay and it's waterproof. I don't know why they'd make a waterproof cooling fan for a computer, but I'm glad they do. Cause there it is. Moving back from that, this is my uh, reversing contactor for the winch underneath here like I said is a 12 volt battery it's just out of a lawn and garden tractor just a little lead acid battery and then up here is a fuse block for the various systems there's a fuse for the uh, you know the, the power for the controller that's got a fuse on it and I mean just everything anything that's anything that has power going to it should have a fuse on it that helps um, help save your wiring harness if something goes wrong and it can also help you diagnose problems problems when they do moving back from that underneath here the other side's a little bit better and I'll we'll show you that too but this is a, a chain and this chain is driven from my steering wheel through an electric power steering pump or electric power steering gearbox modern cars don't have power steering pumps anymore back in the good old days they used to have a, a pump you have to forgive me, I don't know who my audience is here. So back in the good old days, you had a hydraulic pump that ran off of your engine with a fan belt. And you had to top it up with oil and it would leak and there was hoses and it made noise. And well, they got away from all that stuff. It's also not very efficient because going down the highway, you don't really need to have a power steering. Because first of all, you're not steering all that much. And second of all, once you're rolling, it's a lot easier to steer than when you're parking. But that pump is always going and, and taking some power from your engine. And that reduces fuel economy. So they've moved to electric power steering. So that's what this is inside here. And it's basically just a, an electric motor that has a sh uh, has a two-piece shaft moving through it. The shaft here on top. And then there's like a little coupler with a rubber, a rubber bushing in the middle of it. Some people might know it as a Lovejoy connection. It's something like that. And that Lovejoy connection has some compression. So whenever you put a steering input to it, your steering wheel turns. But then the load down here doesn't turn as fast. And then there's two sensors. When this sensor sees a difference, when these sensors have a difference, then the motor kicks in and assists you to turn. It's a fantastic device. It's super quiet, super efficient. When you don't need it, it's not doing anything. And, uh, you know, it's no wonder that they use it all. And I would imagine that you could use it for anything because it doesn't just turn, you know, two turns. You could just use it as a torque multiplier for, for anything. I don't know what you would use it for. Maybe like a, a hand crank to wind a boat onto a trailer or something, you know, whatever, anything that's hard to turn, you could put that little torque multiply in there and make it easier. Anyway, moving on from there, up here on the dashboard, we've got some gauges happening. 
On the left here we've got a 12 volt battery uh, indicator. In the middle we've got the main display for the high voltage pack, the 48 volt pack. It tells me how many amp hours I have remaining in the pack, what my current voltage is, how many amps are being used. And when you multiply amps times volts, you end up with watts. So down here in the bottom right corner, it's also got a little watt display that shows you how many watts are being consumed. And when I flip the thing on, um, just running stuff that's on, uh, it uses 0.51 amps and 28 watts. If I turn the controller on for the motor, the inverter, that bumps my power up to about one and a half amps, 83 watts. The reason for that is the controller itself uses some electricity to be on, and then there's also the water pump turning. Turn that off and everything changes. I have an engraved plate for this, but at the moment it's not quite done, and there's kind of a lot of work involved with getting it on here, so I haven't quite done that yet. Back from there, we've got a little three-point hitch. Now this is actually a Category 1 three-point hitch. It meets all the dimensions of a Category 1, and I got those dimensions from a Kubota BX2200, my, my little lawn um, subcompact tractor. So I just took a, a notepad and a tape measure out there and measured the distance between this top arm to where the pivot is. This is what raises and lowers it. And then the distance from this pivot to the pivot of the lower, the lower links right there. And just everything. And the, the distance between where this pin goes to that and how high it is off the ground. And I just, took, I just copied all the measurements off of my Kubota. So that's what that is. A little two-inch receiver so I can put a ball in there. This is currently set up for a pin. I've got a, a little trailer that I cut the grass with. It's got a little pin that goes right there. And this is all controlled by a linear actuator. Let me turn this on and we can get some action shot of that happening. So. Yeah, so that actuator, it's a 1200 pound lift actuator. Uh, now it's one of the, you know, kind of off of eBay made in China actuators. Now, will it actually do 1,200 pounds? I don't know. But if it does, then these arms are good for about 300 pounds of lifting force. Moving around from there, a lot the same. We've got some fuses over here. Got to keep things fused, like I said. This is the main fuse for the drive motor. This is a 400 amp fuse. Now, this is a slow blow fuse meaning that you can put more amperage through this and it won't blow out. But if you continue to have amperage, excessive amperage through there, it will blow out. Uh, I've had as much as 500 amps flow through this controller, but this 400 amp fuse obviously didn't blow out. Now, if I'd have had my foot into it for many seconds, it would have. These fuses are 50 amp slow blow fuses. But if you put a lot more than 50 amps in there, they'll blow out. So... I just recently learned that if I try and uh, use my electric power takeoff, which I'll get to in a minute, this uh, this fuse right up here that did actually blow out because when I turned the motor, when I flipped the motor switch on, it uh, you know it rushed through like 100 or 150 amps and it blew that out right quick. This lower one is for my charger and also my DC DC converter, which we talked about earlier. That's where those two, that's where the power comes in from the charger, goes through the fuse, and comes out from the battery and goes into the DC-DC. This here, this here is my contactor for my electric power takeoff. Now every, you know, every decent sized tractor has a power takeoff. You would usually use it to connect a bush hog and you'd like plug a shaft into it. Well, since I don't have that uh, shaft, what I do have is a battery that I can run other electric appliances, other electric implements with. That's what that there plug is. So whenever I flip a switch on the dashboard, that contactor closes and sends 48 volts battery voltage directly out of there. And I've also got another one up here. And the idea with that is you get yourself a little 48 inch lawnmower deck. This one happens to be out of the Cub Cadet wide frame. You get the lawnmower deck and you put an electric motor on it. And then you run an extension cord from the electric motor that goes and plugs into the back. Then you flip that switch, and now you've got a lawnmower. 
At the moment, this is just a lawnmower. What I want to do is I want to put heavier, beefier wheels on the front of it and make it a trailer that is supporting the lawnmower deck. Right now, all of the weight of the lawnmower is just being transmitted through the tongue of the, uh, of the mower and through this part right here. And these welds break all the time. It's, it's an okay design, but it's not a good design. I'm going to design it much better. Uh, if it makes it through the summer, then I'll redesign it this fall. But that's how that works. In addition to this, I also have a wood chipper and a pressure washer and a little tiller that uh, have a, is, this motor is a universal mount. You can see how it's mounted into a three-point hitch. Well, I slide the motor out, and I can slide that motor into the other implements. So I don't need three or four motors when I only need to use, need one at any given time. The uh, the paint was done by a guy I work with. He likes to go by the name Kevin. So, Kevin, thank you for the the beautiful paint job. This hood was kind of interesting. So this is two hoods. It's the, the hood off of the narrow frame, the one, two, three, and then the back half of the hood from the other one. That, that might not be true, but it's the back half of another hood. Now what you may not be able to notice in this picture is as it goes from the front of the hood to the back, it actually gets taller. What you can definitely notice is from the front of the hood to the back of the hood, it gets narrower. Well, since I took the back half of one hood and put it on the very back of the other hood, it didn't match up at all. This was too short because it had started to shrink down already. So I had to cut right here, bend this down and put a piece in. And then it was also too narrow or it was too wide up here because this has already come down to its peak and this is already starting to come out. So I had to cut some lines right here, draw this together and weld it up. Now it looks pretty good in the camera, but the closer you look, the worse it is. We'll just leave it at that. Let's see what else I think that's pretty much takes care of the walk around oh the winch is going to be used for this right here I haven't done it yet but uh, over here there's this structure the structure right here this bolts to the undercarriage of the front half of the tractor this is the plow that goes on the front of that and at some point this is going to go on the front of that also I'll have a three-point hitch set up on the front that is raised and lowered by the winch. So that device, that's just a brush hog. Like um, you've seen them before, like the DR mower brush hogs that you walk behind, they got big wheels and they're powered. That's what that's gonna be. So that's gonna be on the front and it will be used by the winch. So the winch could be used for recovery, but 99% of the time it'd be used to raise and lower either the plow or that uh, brush hog. I think that covers it. Uh, oh yeah, and then for brakes, I got I took the brakes off of a 2002 ZX6R and painted the calipers red. <laughs> and then for the for the um, the master cylinder, that's just the master cylinder off of the handlebars, and that, they normally clamp onto the handlebars. Well, I took the back half of that clamp off and threw it away, and then just located the holes and drilled holes into my frame and mounted the uh, that same device. The same master cylinder on the frame unfortunately that master cylinder is not good so i couldn't i wasn't able to bleed the brakes but <laughs> a lot of butts in this video you don't really need brakes a lot when you have an electric motor because like i said before electronically two of those phases will get uh, switched in the inverter and when you let you lift your foot off the accelerator it slows down and it slows down right now too it's a lot of reverse torque well, okay, I think that just about covers it. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to give a, a brief walk around and an introduction to this if you haven't seen it. Feel free to go check out my other videos on this cadet and the other videos of other things that I've made. And uh, as always, thanks for watching. We'll see you next time.